This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. I'm your host, Rubonzo. This podcast features conversations with indie music artists and indie pros and me. It's all intended to help other artists be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. That wasn't too bad. It was pretty close. My guest in this episode is musician-turned-entrepreneur-educator Michael Walker of Modern Musician. The goal at Modern Musician is to help musicians supercharge their fan base. They do this using grassroots techniques that Michael and his band Paradise Fears did to make waves on the alternative charts before he ultimately shifted to entrepreneur-slash-educator. And they've got a system on top of it now. It's pretty... uh, pretty intricate, pretty uh, in-depth, and you'll hear all about that in our conversation. This podcast, by the way, is made possible through the generosity of listeners just like you. One of the easiest ways that you can get involved and support is to join the Unstarving Musician community at unstarvingmusician.com. In doing so, you'll get tips and insights you can use in your music journey, and not just for me and my years of experience, but also from the hundreds of other musicians I've talked to as part of the Unstarving Musician project and podcast. Plus, you will get a free copy of the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs ebook, and that's all for free, just for being part of the community. Please visit our sponsor page to learn more about how you can offer support for the podcast. I should call it our crowd sponsor page because it's unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor. So yeah, Michael's career before Modern Musician, we talk about that, why and when artists come to Modern Musician for help. I also talk about that. And how they, Modern Musician, figure out the ideal client profile. It's been a lot of trials and errors he shares. We talk a little bit about my dog who was relegated to the hole. That's what I call the little place where I record these episodes at. And uh, we get into some detail on the three-tier system that Modern Musician has developed. And this covers the three main things that you need to dial in to be successful, according to Modern Musician. It all makes a lot of great sense. I think you want to listen to that part very closely. We discuss marketing tools and practices they teach their clients to leverage and how Modern Musician gets the word out about what they're doing. Hey, do you have an artist website yet? If you do, do you like it? If you don't, why not? (laughs) Listen, I want you to um, get your website together. And if you don't know where to start, I encourage you to go to Banzoogle and check out what they have to offer It is the easiest all-in-one pro website platform for musicians and bands. And why do I care? Why should you care? Because it's one of the things you can do to ensure that you're in control of your music business and your fan-based community. So if you don't yet have your own website or you're unhappy with the one you do have, go to bandzoogle.com to start a 30-day free trial. You can use the promo code ROBONZO to get 15% off your first year. And plans start at just, wait for it, $8.29 a month. It's really easy to use. You don't have to worry about plugins, security updates, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, be happy. <laughs> Banzoogle takes care of that for you. I use it, and I love it. I use it on my artist website, robonzo.com. So see for yourself. Go to banzoogle.com. Use the promo code robonzo, R-O-B-O-N-Z-O, to start your free trial today. So Michael plays live in this episode. He's only the second guest on the podcast to ever do that. The other one was David Barrett, the um, famed harmonica teacher. But uh, yeah, Michael busts out a little jam for us. It was great. It was really good. He covers a Ron Pope song, so um, stick around for that. It just kind of falls out all of a sudden, breaks out. All right, here is me and Michael Walker of Modern Musician. I know you're uh, a musician. I saw some of the stuff you did a while back. Are you still writing, performing, or recording or any of that stuff anymore? Yeah, in terms of music, uh, to be honest, you know, for about ten years, we really focused full time uh, with Paradise Fears, and and we toured uh, usually nine or ten months out of the year. We were gone, and uh, we released an album that uh, hit number two on iTunes on the alternative album charts, and uh, reached reached a point that we uh, we got to. I, I felt really 
really proud and grateful for just to be able to meet a lot of our idols, you know, growing up in the music world and get to, you know, record with them and go on tour. But uh, near the end of that, when I met my wife and I started thinking about starting a family and I was gone for like 10 or 11 months out of the year, uh, sort of was in this state of transition and trying to figure out what um, what's next and, you know, what could I do to provide for them without necessarily being gone as, as often. And that's when I started Honor Musician. And since then, I mean, music is always going to be a part, a huge part of my life. And and I still, you know, I've got my uh, my keyboard here that I can jam out with as, I, <laughs> as I'm meeting with people. And, mm-hmm. and I'm still writing new songs. And I've got like a new music project I'm, that's like a passion thing that I'm working on for fun. But um, relatively, I think a huge new passion that I've really been focusing most of my time on in the past couple of years has really been Modern Musician. And, and the music has been just a fun creative outlet, but it's not necessarily the thing that I'm focusing on to like, you know, pay the bills anymore. Yeah. Okay. Well, I would love to talk a little bit about how you, um, are getting the word out for modern musician, but before, before that, um, probably some more relevant, uh, potentially more relevant things I wanted to ask. Um, so why and when do artists typically come to you for help? Mm. The artists that we look for to work with, um, and what we offer is like a 12, 12 week, uh, coaching program where they work with our, our whole team and we basically help to launch uh, a marketing system and, and teach them how to, how to use digital marketing and create advertising campaigns and who we look for specifically, um, because we have a, like a very small number of clients that we work with personally because our coaches do a lot of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. And so what we look for is we look for where there's a gap between when an artist has really honed their craft and the music is really solid and they've invested, you know, they've, the, the recordings are really good, but they just have no idea when it comes to how to promote it properly or how to actually make an income with the music then we look for where there's like a gap between the quality of the music and the reach that they're getting with, with their audience. And if there's a big gap, then awesome. You know, that's kind of where we can come in to help them learn how to, how to fill the gap. So specifically it's focusing around taking the music that they already have, that they've already invested into and putting it in front of the right people who are most likely to really resonate and teach them how to build a tribe and how to connect with those people and how to make offers and how to generate an income from it. Yeah. Do you, um, does modern musician ever work with, um, PR companies or reps in, you know, partnering? Yeah. You know, we just did a summit where I interviewed some really amazing, um, amazing like experts in the music industry. And, uh, Ariel Hyatt was one of those and Mm -hmm. she's, you know, based in the PR publicity world and, and, that's mostly the extent to which we've kind of collaborated and worked with with PR agencies. But she's awesome, and and she had just like a, a killer interview where she delivered a ton of value. That's cool. So yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, how, how did you, was it instinctive for you to hone in on that characteristic of the ideal client, or was, it, was there a process of sort of figuring that out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Definitely was a result of, like most things in, in my life that have eventually become successful, uh, a lot of failure and a lot of mistakes and trying to figure stuff <laughs> out and trying a bunch of different stuff and then yeah. basically just seeing like, oh, like you know, this, all this stuff didn't work, but this is the thing that really resonated and this is what really provided the most value and this is what, what people need the most help with. Mm-hmm. And so it was definitely a process of kind of iterating and fine tuning it over time and figuring out, oh, this is where people really need, need the most help. Yeah. Okay. Good deal. Tell me about the, um, I think that um, I got my dog here. He, uh, <laughs> he was banished to this room cause someone came to the door and he's got this thing about, uh, not liking some people. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what kind of dog do you have? He's a, uh, Panamanian street dog. I'll have to send you a picture. I'd hold him up to camera. He's a little big, not huge, but, um, I'll send you a picture. He's kind of interesting looking. Uh, um, there's a, I think a Central American breed that's been identified that he appears to be part of um, yeah. is a funny mix. You'll, I'll send you a picture. Um, cool. Now it's got I'm, I'm jealous. Now I it's got to go in the show somewhere. notes. <laughs> nice, nice. I, I want a dog so bad, man. I, when I'm so I grew up and I had a, a dog growing up with my family, a, a golden lab, and mm-hmm. and I met my wife, and so I was always a dog person growing up, and I met my wife, and and she had four cats. <laughs> 
And so I quickly learned to become a, a cat person as well. I learned mm. to love, love cats too, but, but I do, there's part of me that's like, Oh, I want a dog. I love, I love dogs so much. And <laughs> they're playing, uh, going for walks. We brought a, uh, monster 15 pound cat with us from California to where we live in Panama. And they're actually really good buddies. It's pretty funny. So, um, not, not, well, we figured they'd hope they'd be all right, but, um, yeah, I think it would be interesting for musicians listening to this to understand the three tier system that you set up. Um, I, I've just kind of read a tiny bit about it. It was available when you're not an insider. So tell, tell us about it. Yeah, for sure. So the three main pillars that, that we focus on that we found for any music career, these are kind of the three main things that you need to dial in in order to, to be successful are one, your artistic identity two, your fan base and your marketing to grow your fan base. And then three, the revenue generation. So like, how are you going to make an income so you can invest back into the music? And those three kind of, they tie into each other and they're all interrelated and they're all super important. And if you don't, if you don't have one of them, then you're not going to be successful. You need all, all three of them. And specifically, uh, artistic identity is about your brand and your music and you know, having something that's unique that sets you apart, that is really that's high quality. That you know, that usually what we found works best is usually in terms of commercial success, is having uh, like one foot in, one foot out. So having uh, something. So for example, a lot of viral covers that you might see of of songs, they include some nature of like familiarity where you know, for for the cover song maybe someone recognizes the song it's a really popular song but then there needs to be that unique twist like there needs to be something that sets it apart that kind of makes you go oh like i wasn't expecting that mm. and those two things together usually are what when you look at things that go viral usually there's some element of familiar so it ties in with the global consciousness of what people are focusing on and then there's that unique thing that kind of sets it apart that's like oh like that's that's interesting Um, but specifically for, I mean, for a lot of artists, your artistic identity comes from who you are and it comes from expressing yourself and just being authentic to who you are. And that's, what's so beautiful about music is that it's not necessarily a right or wrong way to do it so much so that the most important thing is just that you're being authentic to, to yourself and that you're expressing who you are. And there's a quote I think I heard, I I don't remember who it was or exactly what the quote was, but. Uh, something about what the world needs most is is for you to to be yourself and for you to share your gifts. And I think that there is a there's a balance, right? Because you want to be in a market that has some commercial options, depending on what your goals are. You know, you want there to be a market for your kind of music. But at the same time, there's a balance of you don't want to just neglect who you are and just pretend pretend and just like change everything in order to match that. And so I think what we found more than anything that's really encouraging is that with the marketing tools that are available to you now with Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, there's billions of people in the world and there's so many people that, you know, that they're going to resonate with who you are and with your music and you can find those people. And yeah, I don't think that there's anyone that doesn't have, um, doesn't have the ability with those tools to be able to build a tribe, to build an audience that's going to resonate with your music. It's just a matter of finding those people. Um, but that is one of the, one really, one piece of the puzzle is that you need to really kind of reflect on who am I and, and as an artist, what's my brand and who do I, you know, what's my message? Who do I want to attract? Who's the best fit audience? Who's really most likely to resonate with, with my music. And that's step one. And step number two is once you really have something worth you know, delivering and worth promoting and something that's really going to add value and it's going to connect with people, then you need to figure out how do I put that in front of the right people who are most likely to enjoy that and connect with them and build a relationship and, you know, really form, form a tribe. And so that process, there's a lot of different ways and tools you can do to, to do that. And they're constantly changing too. Right now, what we found has been the most effective by far is messenger campaigns where basically Mm -hmm. the point is that you start a conversation with with a new fan and you just as like a human you have a conversation with them and and we have something called uh, your intune survey framework which is 
just a fancy way of, of uh, saying it's a model for like what questions you can ask fans to have a conversation with them, to connect with them and build rapport. And really it's just about having a conversation and having a conversation with new fans. And, but in terms of marketing your music, the, the most important things like, and this is fundamental to any sort of business, whether it's music or any other type of business is that one, you have to figure out where do your people hang out who are most likely to get value from what you offer. So you have to just kind of get clarify and figure out, okay, who's my best fit audience and where do they congregate? You know, right. where do they hang out? And then uh, the next step is that you need to introduce yourself to them. So you need to put your music in front of those people. Uh, for my band, one of the first things that we did when we were starting out was we actually went to shows where there was big lines of people waiting um, to go into the show. And we just walked up to people and we introduced ourselves and, and said, hey, you know, here's uh, because you're a fan of all time low. I think you might like our music, too. I've got some headphones if you'd be interested in listening to it. But I should probably warn you, most people who listen enjoy it so much, they start to like cry and faint. So if you need any <laughs> tissues, I've got a backpack full of tissues. I've got really fast reflexes. I'll make sure you don't faint. Um, and that was just an example of just finding the people who are most likely to really get value out of the music and connecting with them and building a relationship. And so that's phase number two is really figuring out the marketing. And now with like paid traffic and paid marketing, there's some really cool opportunities that you can use to automate and to be able to bring people in consistently to have those conversations. You can even build automated tools that essentially have conversations with people so that because that's that's what honestly that's one of the biggest problems that we run into now when we're working with artists is that after we launch the campaign, usually within a week, they have all these messages from new fans who are enjoying the music and they're having these conversations, and they literally just can't keep up with the amount of messages that are coming in, and it's a serious problem because you know because they can't scale and it's it's a good problem to have it's it's almost like people love you too much so like you have to you know you have to it, it breaks things down. So at that point, it's really powerful to build like an automated messenger system so that you can have these conversations in a way that feels personal and that's authentic. And you know, less people, you don't want to like deceive people into thinking like it's like a real person, but you can still build this flow for them that feels really personal and has your voice. Um, so that's, that's phase number two is growing, growing your audience. And can I ask a quick question first, about that? Um, yeah. Do you, do you guys work? Um, on a component at this point, you know, where it gets a little overwhelming and you've got some of the auto automation going on where um, you have the artists work to funnel some of those people into uh, like a private community such as Patreon or a Facebook group or maybe some other alternative? Mm, 100%. Yeah. So the messenger conversation is sort of an in, inter uh, component. It's really just like a, a vehicle to take people from that initial conversation to joining your private community. And you can do that on Patreon is a great place to connect with people and build like a, a paying community. Um, what we found right now is has been working really well for our artists is just having a private Facebook group that's free to join. And after people go through this, this uh, Intune survey with that's automated, where it's based on how they answer the questions, we're able to filter out the people who aren't really resonating with the songs and take the people who are really connecting with it and invite them into the private community. And then you can do things where you can create lookalike audiences based on the people who are really resonating most. What, and does, you that, can what does that mean? So on Facebook and Instagram, I, this is the stuff I geek out about. I, I love I love look like audiences and and talking about like advertising. But um, basically, what you can do is if you have a group of people, you need at least one hundred people, and you upload them to Facebook and Instagram uh, and their business managers, then you can create a look like audience uh, yeah, of people yeah. that match the same characteristics as those people mm -hmm. and then find it creates usually between one to 2 million people that most closely match the characteristics of the people that, that you give them. Mm. And so if you have an audience of people who've you know, spent over a thousand dollars on your music and you know that those are the people who are your super fans who really resonate with you, then you can literally create this audience and say, find more people like this and then plug those in. Yeah. And at this point, you know, we're spending between 35,000 to $40,000 a month on ads every month. And with a few exceptions, I would say 95% of our ad sets, our audiences are all based on lookalike audiences. Like none of them are, are cold, cold audiences anymore. Wow. Yeah. That's funny. I asked what that was and um, it's been around for maybe a few years now or more because I 
suddenly remembered I was looking at some ad campaigns a while back and reading about this and learning how it works, but it's been a long time, so I'm sure it's changed. Um, that's really cool. Did, I'm sorry, you didn't get through all of them yet. I interrupted you. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so uh, phase number three, and this is one that a lot of artists get tripped up on, I think, is is the revenue part of it and actually making an income. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of there's sort of this uh, this limiting belief that um, that you shouldn't be making money with your artwork or somehow that that might taint it or you might lose some artistic um integrity if you kind of if you start making money so that's a lot of times that's like an internal belief that needs to be, sort of be processed and let go of in order to be successful with it and then in, in realizing that the more money you make the more people you can reach and the bigger impact you're going to make and the more positive things you can do and really it's not about how much money can you make so much as how much value can you provide and how many people can you reach and and money really allows you to do that but it's really important to to have that component figured out and to actually have a system for keeping track of your metrics and knowing like how much are you making from this this ad set and this this campaign and, and making sure that you're scaling the things that are working. And specifically, um, what we recommend doing and what we do with our artists is we build out a value ladder of different price points, of different things that they're going to offer. And a lot of artists neglect the high ticket end of their offers and that's like that's a huge I know, I know for our band a lot of our income probably the majority of it actually came from the high the high ticket items that we offered like private parties where you know someone could hire us to play a birthday party or you know weddings and a lot of those you can get paid five thousand ten thousand dollars for a single one and so what we recommend is kind of building out uh, different price points and having at least four different ones, you know, one at the very low end, that's sort of that entry level. And you could even do it as like a free plus shipping type of offer where you have this free merch bundle and they just pay for the shipping to kind of get it out. And that could be an, an intro, an intro point to your offers. And then you might have a VIP bundle that's around $50. And then you might have, a um, hundred dollar offer that's like your inner circle. Maybe it's a subscription. You could host it through Patreon if you wanted to, to use like those different tiered tiered models. And then the high ticket offer I think is is super valuable. Um, and you can either do like a you can do custom songs or play weddings or private parties or you know there's there's a lot of different opportunities. But uh, no matter what you do, you can get creative and and figure out how can we provide the most value. What do people really want? What what's going to benefit? Um, what's going to benefit our audience, and then you can cater those offers to them based on the feedback that you're getting. Cool. That cover all three of them. Yep. So that's <laughs> that's the three. And to recap, that's so the first one was artistic identity. Um, that one's all about your music brand. Yeah. And uh, number two was your fan base. So how are you bringing in new people? How are you connecting with those people, building a tribe? And then number three is once you have the tribe and you really have this audience, how do you monetize it so that you can have a sustainable income? You can focus on your music full time and you can continue to create more songs for that yeah. and keep dialing in your artistic identity. Cool. Um, I was noticing that you have uh, events posted on the website is there one coming up or I, I couldn't tell if it's happened yet or if it's coming up or if it's an, uh, kind of an ongoing thing evergreen thing yeah so that's a great question because we just wrapped up um, our we have an annual event that we do called the uh, success with music virtual music conference and this last year was awesome it was it was our third year doing it and this time we got featured on the Grammys website uh, we had over 10,000 people register live and nice. it, was just, it was really cool. And there's, you know, there's 14, 14 people that we interviewed on it. And it was, it was, it was fun, but also a ton of work and really exhausting. Um, so I, once a year is kind of our, our limit of doing those live, but this year we just put together something, um, because, you know, there's so much work and effort went into it. And we wanted to, to kind of take some of those, those interviews that we did and, and recycle them and make sure that people who didn't get a chance to watch it could still get value from it. So we did just um, create like an evergreen version of it that gives you access to four of those interviews for free. Um, so that that is something that we added recently that's uh, you know available for free on the website. Cool. What's it called? It's called uh, Success with Music Virtual Music Conference. And uh, easiest way to, I mean, if you search for it on Google, you might go to the the live event that's already closed. So the easiest way would be just on our, our main website. Okay. On modern-musician.com, right? 
modern-musician.com. <laughs> we, we want, we're trying to get the original modernmusician.com and it's um it's like a Chinese website forum. It, it, in order to in order to contact them and reach them, you need to submit uh, one of those verification questions uh, in Chinese. And so we tried to translate it and submit it, but we can't get past their their oh, initial wow. verification question. It's like, what's Eddie Vaughn's guitar name in, in Chinese? And oh, we're trying wow. to like translate it and we can't do it. But. Calling all Chinese speakers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. if you're watching this right now and you speak fluent Chinese, then... <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a fee in it for you. <laughs> yep, exactly. Wow. Um yeah, so I, I want to go back to talking about how you get the word out um, these days with what you're doing and what kind of things you're considering doing to continue to s- spread the word. Yeah, so you mean for like us in terms of promoting Modern Musician or like our artists for promoting themselves? Uh, predominantly, I was asking about, about you guys and you know how you get found um, promoting your services, whatever you're promoting. Yeah, so this is we're coming up on the uh, about halfway through year two as, as a business, and uh, our like ninety five percent of our traffic right now comes from Facebook and Instagram ads, and so we're spending you know roughly twenty twenty to twenty five thousand dollars a month just just for our business to reach reach people, and we've built. Um, a value delivery system, like a, a funnel that leads to an offer to apply for our, our coaching program for people who are a good fit. And that's like, we've been running that for like two and a half years now. And I basically share the story of um, how we started out and we lived in our cars and and uh, my band, we didn't know what we were doing starting out. We started, we booked our own tour and then I remember playing the tour and, and we realized quickly that you actually had to get people to come out to the shows in order for it to be successful. Yeah, and I remember living in our cars and and eating peanut butter tortillas for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, <laughs> and flour or corn. And, uh, <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I love the fact that you just asked that question. Hey, I'm the Mex- corn one, Mexican I, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so I. Personally, I know the corn ones, I think, were a little bit more healthy, but I personally was, a, was more of a fan of the flour <laughs> ones. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we would throw a banana in there if we want to get really, really fancy with it. But um, but really, the thing that, that changed everything around for us was um, our lead singer had, had that idea to basically approach fans who are waiting in lines for shows and introduce ourselves and, and share some of our music. And I was a super shy, awkward kid, so like, I was stuttering and shaking as I walked up to people and it was really, really scary, but it ended up working really well. And we sold 24,000 CDs doing that in about four and a half months. And one yeah. of the bands that we were doing it on, uh, called all time low, just decided to bring us on their next tour. Um, and that was kind of our big, our big break. And so this workshop that I teach, um, that really 95% of our traffic comes from this, uh, really just shares that strategy and it's just like, hey, you know, this was the number one thing that we ever did as a band probably and you know, this still works right now with well this, and when there's not a global pandemic. Um, <laughs> but you know we've had quite a few artists who've gone out and, and done that and uh, there's one band, there's two guys in the band they made eleven thousand dollars in a single month going and doing it and there's people and it's awesome. But I also realized uh, that most people, like 99% of people that were hearing that story, loved the story of of how it works and saw how it works. But they're like, I have commitments. Like, I can't just like leave and go follow tours or or I don't really want to go do that or I just meet strangers in line for tours. It's scary. Um, so really what we've pivoted to is is this um, this model of this virtual – we call it virtual tour hacking. The original one we call tour hacking. So it's like meeting people in, at, in lines for those shows. And this is really based on the same principles as when we walked up to those people online. But it's done virtually using those messenger campaigns and you still have conversations. It's, it's really like – it's it's very similar, but it's just done virtually and, and it can be automated and scaled. So that's really what we found has been a lot more accessible to, to the artists that we're working with. And they're like, oh, yeah, like, great. I don't have to go you know, stand in lines and, and meet strangers, but I can actually still grow my audience significantly by, by using this strategy. And you can make um, soft peanut butter and banana tacos much easier from the comfort of your home while you're doing the virtual tour hacking. <laughs> <laughs> I need to add that to our website. That's <laughs> that's a main selling point. <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah. So you know, I was imagining that you're 
you know, maybe doing the big podcasting circuit. And I know that I, I saw, well, you're going to do another interview here in a while. And I saw that you did one with another mutual friend blanking on the name here. And the face was totally recognizable. And, um, but yeah, it sounds like some of the, I mean, basically the same system that you're able, very similar to what you um, do for your artists or coach them to learn. Uh, you apply for your business today. So that's cool. Yeah, it is. It is funny how how that happened. Like I've noticed this like fractal pattern that happened. And people, anyone listening to this right now, maybe has noticed this in the past. But um, it seems like a lot of the most successful online marketers are teaching in a way. They're teaching the thing that they're using in order to sell their services. Um, like it's happening. They're, that's how they're selling you into their program. They're teaching you how to use that process to sell to to, to different markets. And it's interesting because it's like, oh, it's a self-reflective. It's it's fractal. Like they're doing it. There's the meta, mm-hmm. the meta version of it. Yeah, good um, point. So definitely, there's something powerful about that. That uh, leading by example and being able to just like, you know, to to be sharing from that point that point of experience when, when you're doing it. Yeah. Uh, do you have a home? studio there is that are you in a home studio where you can also record music i am yeah i got my oh yeah <laughs> uh, i got the i got yeah i got a nice little home studio set up but um, since, since you just hit a chord again uh don't feel put on the spot i'll even cut this out if you don't want they want it to be on there but <laughs> do you uh do you in the mood to play anything uh, real quick oh man this is on the spot um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is some Ron Pope. A drop in the ocean, a change in the weather. I was praying that you and me would end up together. Like wishing for rain as I stand in the desert. I'm holding you closer than most. Cause you are my heaven. Very nice, <laughs> man. Virtual clapping. <laughs> now, was that Thank someone? You. Is that someone else's song that I'm not going to be allowed to have on the podcast? Oh no! I totally <laughs> just ruined it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's Ron Pope. That's the cover of Ron Pope. <laughs> yeah, drop drop in the ocean. <laughs> All right, Great that was song. nice. Very nice. Appreciate. It. Yeah, I think you're the um, only the second person to ever play live on the podcast. And I I used to have uh, feature clips of. Um, artists that I'd have on, and there's so much weirdness around having music on podcasts. Um, and I was doing it with people who own their music and all this, and you know, getting permission. But I'm like, meh, you know, it's kind yeah. of a lot of work, added work anyway. So I'm just not going to do it anymore. But I have been thinking in the back of my head, I need to sort of put in the prep thing. By the way, if you want to play a little bit, well, <laughs> yeah, that, that's so. it's fun. That was great. That, that. <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. So, do you play other instruments as well? You play guitar, um, don't I you? I play. I do. I play a little bit of acoustic guitar. Guitar was like the the first instrument that I actually started playing for for myself or like for for pleasure. Mm-hmm. With the piano, it was like I was six years old and I didn't really want to learn how to play the piano, but my parents really wanted me to learn, and so they bribed me with video games. And so I literally I sat down. I learned learned how to play. But the guitar in high school, I was super shy, awkward kid, and and didn't know how to talk to girls at all. But when I picked up the guitar, then I noticed that, you know, that people actually paid attention. And, and, and so the guitar was the first one that I think I started to, to play. And, 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 it, and it felt good to be able to express myself in a way that I didn't really know how um, normally. And, and uh, yeah, so the guitar is sort of like a passion, but I'm also much less technically talented at the guitar. But the piano, I've grown up and that's, that's what I played in the, in the band. And so I've got a lot more experience on, on the piano. That's cool. I think you're uh, in the majority of the crowd that learns when they're young and they didn't want to do it, but then they're really happy they did later. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I'm, I think my dad, um, you know, he started started lessons when he was younger and he ended up quitting. I think he always regretted it. So he, he really wanted to make it worth uh, worth my while to, to keep you know, keep on it um, throughout when I was growing up and the video games, <laughs> it, it did it did work. I, I was a geek. I liked video games, so that, that kept me on the train. That's funny. Your dad's still around? Yeah. Yep. And I, yeah, I, I talk with, with him and my mom, uh, every Sunday and, and yeah, I, I, I feel really grateful for, for them. I just, you know, I feel like, um, I don't know, there, there's, 
they've their story is is pretty inspirational and they really they're like big role role models of mine so i, I appreciate um that that i had them growing up that's nice well tell them it's uh <clears throat> tell them that Robonzo said it's never too late to pick the piano back up <laughs> Hey, I like it. I'll, I'll measure that to my dad. Yeah. I mean, what else has he got to do, right? <laughs> With the yeah. spare time. I'll, I'll tell him. I'll tell him that Robanza said that, and I think he'll be like, "Well, if that's if Robanza said that, then I guess I guess I need to do it." Yeah, my yeah. favorite. I have a former guest. His name's Johnny Bergen, but for a number of years, he he's actually a blues player, but he went by the name Rock and Johnny Bergen. And one of my favorite things to say whenever I had the opportunity was, look, it's like my friend Rock and Johnny Bergen once told me, <laughs> but I can't say it anymore. He's not, <laughs> I can, but it's That's not. That's such a great name. I know. It is really <laughs> nice. Yeah. So what's on the near term horizon um, for, for your business, for your music? I know what's on yes. the horizon for your family. <laughs> yep. Yep. So we got our uh, baby daughter coming in about a month and a half. So we're really excited for that. Amazing. Um, in terms of the business, uh, kind of in the next few months, we're looking at um, one thing that that we're starting to do is we want to create like a weekly live webinar system where basically we're able to once a week do a live webinar where I'm just sharing some of the best some of the best information and the best knowledge that that we have based on the artists that we're working with right now and and then on the back end of that, inviting people to apply for the coaching program. So, so that's one thing that, that we're looking at. And and I'm sure, you know, if anyone that's listening to this right now kind of got into our ecosystem and, and uh, started going through one of the workshops, and you'd probably find your way uh, getting offered one of those webinars at some point. Um, but uh, that's on the, in the short term for the business. And then in the next six months or so, depending on what happens with um, the coronavirus pandemic that that's happening at, at the time that we're recording this, uh, we'd love to do like a modern musician live event uh, as soon as possible, where we can actually just get everyone get everyone out, probably have some performances on stage, and and be able to share um, over like the course of a three day event. We might do it virtually, might do it virtually at, at the end of this year if we need to. Um, so that that's on the radar. We're really excited for that. And uh, musically. You know, we toured full time with with Paradise Fears for you know about about ten years, and then I started this business and started my family, and I've definitely felt the stirrings in my musical my musical soul to want to you know record some more music and to to produce um, some new songs. So I'm working on a new music project right now called Kuno Ego, and it's totally like in the initial seed state and I've uh, started growing using the same strategies that we teach our, our artists right now. I'm, I'm basically, I'm basically creating this new music project and got the first few hundred people in there right now that are sort of starting to listen and, and connect with each other. And it's, it's fun, like feeling like a baby again and kind of seeing some of these relationships form. Um, so on, in the near like three to six month range, I'll, I'll probably look to record with, as uh, as good of a producer as as I can find right now, um, that's you know in the singer songwriter folk folk types of music and try to record a single single with them and, and release that. Cool man, I'm glad to hear it. I you know when I <clears throat> talk to educators um, who have some background like yours with music, I'm I'm always of course curious if they're still uh, playing or thinking about it, and uh, it's always nice to hear. Uh, when they or you are, so that's cool. I'm, I'm happy for you um, on many fronts, but that's great, and look forward to hearing some of that. So, thanks, Ben. I, I appreciate it. To be honest, you know, it's something that uh, drew like a lot of fear for me when I initially started thinking about it because, um, you know, with our band, I, I felt we had 10 years, and I felt pretty proud of what we kind of established, and and we were able, to, I was able to kind of draw from that experience in terms of starting our business, but with this. You know, it's kind of starting from the, the ground up and, you know, I'm also kind of thinking about, you know, like I need to, the proof is in the pudding. Like I need to, you know, what if I like, you know, did this music and I released it and it just like didn't go well or flopped or, you know, something like mm-hmm. that I would feel like a total hypocrite if I'm teaching other artists how to do this. But then I realized. Man, <laughs> That's right, is, right? You would. I mean, you'd feel that way, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And then, and then I also realized like that the fear that I was feeling around releasing my music was literally the exact same fear that I'm coaching our artists around releasing their music. And it's really more about being seen and being allowing yourself to be heard and seen. And there's a lot of like, 
you know, fear around that as, as humans, I think. And it really holds a lot of us back from releasing our music because we're like, is it good enough? Am I good enough? What if it isn't successful? What if it flops? And usually all of that is just like, you know, sort of garbage that, you know, does that just holds us back from, from learning and growing. And, and so, yeah, I've sort of had to reflect a bit and just be like, oh yeah, you know, that's part of the process is like that, that fear is, is normal. And, and I do feel really grateful for just the community that we've built and the team and, and yeah, like the strategies, like, it's cool. Like I launched the system in the first week and I was like, you know, a couple of months later I'd made a few dozen sales and, and to have a bunch of new fans coming in who actually genuinely care about the music. And there was a guy who, um, like change his profile picture on Facebook to like the graphics from, from Q no ego. And I was like, super oh, fan. Oh, I'm like, this, yeah, it, it's, it's like, Rich, he's like, you know, can, can I run your, can I run your, your fan club? And I'm like, like, sure. Like, that's cool. Like we've never met before. You don't know who I am. Like, this is, this is awesome. And so, yeah, it's like, it's, it's funny in some ways I'm sort of like a baby again. Uh, but I also have, you know, I'm drawn from this experience with, with paradise fears and I'm also working with all these other artists and we're all in the same boat in a lot of ways. I think, you know, there's, it's like the, the analogy that I use is it's sort of like we're surfers and there's, there's always a wave that's passed. There's a lot of waves that have passed. And a lot of times we'll kind of try to catch up to those waves, but it's like, nope, like that wave's already passed, you know, it's going to be difficult. But if you're willing to sort of look at the unknown you're, or you're willing to kind of look at what's happening right now and kind of look backwards and be like, oh, there's this wave that's swelling that's kind of coming up right now. And if you can kind of swim along with that mm -hmm. then and catch that, then it can give you this huge initial momentum that kind of shoots you forward. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, no one has everything figured out. Like every, we're all, <laughs> we're all still figuring things out. We all make mistakes and, and we just got to do the best we can with, with what we know how. Yeah. And it's constantly changing, right? <laughs> Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and uh, have you assigned yourself a mentor either in-house or outside for this whole endeavor? Yeah. So I'm actually, we, we've got eight coaches that are, in, that are in our, in our program that are working with artists. And so I scheduled a bunch of sessions with me. <laughs> so they're kind of, you know, with their, their boss, they're basically like having, going through this and, and helping me launch this. And, and also I've invested uh, when I first started the business, I, you know, I invested about $36,000 into different business coaches and, and mentorship and $36,000 I didn't have, uh, mind you, <laughs> like, like the, the monthly options. And, and it, I don't know, I, it was, it was scary. There's, there's a while there for you know, probably the first year or so where I hadn't, like I was still, get, I'd made a lot of mistakes. I was trying to figure out what's going to land and how to, how to make this successful. And I was about to be a dad and, and it, it probably in my kind of lowest moment, I just kind of felt like a failure of a husband and a father because I, I didn't know how I was going to provide for, for my family. And I got to this point where I was about $36,000 in debt and trying to, and, and it wasn't until probably about the first year or so that things really started to click into place and I started to gain traction. And it's amazing what's happened in the last couple of years since then. But, um, you know, it's definitely been, uh, it's been a journey and, and that, that mentorship that I invested into has hands down been the best investment that I've ever, ever made in my life. But you know, it's, it's scary. It's scary to, to invest and oh, Siri is talking to me. She thinks that I'm saying, Hey Siri, it's scary to invest. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that's, I think the best investment that you can possibly make is into yourself and your education. And specifically, I think investing in your marketing as a business, uh, is always a really valuable investment because it tends to to pay dividends. Yeah, cool, man. I love it. Well, I wish you all the success in the second half of the year. It's really nice to meet you. Hope to stay in touch. Um, I look forward to hearing your music. Thank you for spending time with me today. This episode was powered by ConvertKit. I have been a ConvertKit user since early 2016, and I really love it for the email marketing aspects of what I do. It's more than just an email marketing company, though. They are focused on landing pages, too, giving beginner creators everything they need to start building their email lists. Their new free plan allows creators to make unlimited landing pages and forms, and you can choose from multiple templates, personalize them with design, Include an incentive email, create a thank you page, manage all your subscribers, and of course, send broadcast emails. The support is great, and that is important to me. To learn how ConvertKit can help you connect with your audience so that you can make a living doing work you love, 
Go to unstarvingmusician.com forward slash convert or the show notes for this episode. Did you know you can help other independent artists find this podcast by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening to your podcast these days? It really does help, so I hope you will consider it. The Unstarving Musician podcast is made possible through the support and generosity of listeners like you. One of the easiest ways to support the podcast, if you're a musician, is to join the Unstarving Musician community, which you can do at, you guessed it, unstarvingmusician.com. In joining the community, you get tips and insights you can use in your music journey that comes not only from me and my years of experience, but also from the hundreds of other musicians that I speak to as part of the Unstarving Musician project and podcast. Plus, you'll get a free copy of my Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs ebook, the official version, and that's all for free just for being part of the community. You can learn about other ways of offering support by visiting the Unstarving Musician crowd sponsor page at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash crowd sponsor. And if you have feedback, please go to unstarvingmusician.com to get all my contact info. You can text me, call me, email me, leave a voice message right there on that page. Just go down to the bottom of the page and you'll find everything you need to know. I really would love to hear any of your comments, suggestions, questions, whatever you've got. And you can find links to just about everything talked about in this episode at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. All right, I'm peacing out. (laughs) Thank you for listening and sharing with your musician friends and fellow indie music fans. Peace, gratitude, and a whole lot of love.